Now, because I know that you're a learned congregation uh, that loves an intellectual challenge, uh, I'm going to start this morning with a quiz question. So who can tell me the connection, or a connection, there, there might be several, between Paul's second letter to Timothy and Mary Poppins the movie? Anyone? Quiet? Paul? Okay. Well, the answer that, that I had in mind is that they both contain a word which is found nowhere else in contemporary literature or culture. And the technical term that academics and etymologists use to describe this phenomenon is a hapax legomenon, which is a wonderful Greek phrase which means something that is spoken once and once only. And in Mary Poppins, the hapax legomenon is, of course, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, uh, the very sound of which was considered by that esteemed student of grammar and linguistics, Mr. Dick Van Dyke, to be something quite atrocious. But then, Mr. Van Dyke was also one of the foremost proponents of the literary hypothesis that if you say this word loud enough, you'll always sound precocious. Now, in 2 Timothy, the hapax legomenon is the word theopneustos, uh, a word which is often translated as God-breathed or inspired by God. And it's found in chapter 3, verse 16, which Tim's just read for us, where Paul says, all scripture is theopneustos. Uh, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the problem with the hapax legomenon uh, is that with it being found only once in literature, uh, you have nothing to compare it with. And so you may be able to work out its meaning, uh, and we can with Theopneustos. We know it's something to do with God and his breath or his inspiration. But at the same time, you've got no idea how it was commonly used, what its sense was, and what people understood by it. And this sense of context is really important for how we understand words and their meaning. And as a working example of this, if you were to say that you wanted a bag of chips, then you get something very different depending on whether you're standing in Harry Ramsden's, an American supermarket, a Las Vegas casino, or a microprocessing factory. <laughs> now, our theme this morning is the authority, the authenticity of the Bible, what it is that we think we're reading when we open its pages, and how we're able to trust what we read there. And the word theopneustos is central to this discussion. Because Paul says in 2 Timothy that all scripture is theopneustos, the argument is commonly made that God has inspired the writers of the books of the Bible with the words to write, that he has in effect dictated those books. And so those books contain the very words of God himself transcribed through human fingers. And indeed we subscribe to that, don't we, when we follow the Bible readings in church with the response, this is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. But there are several problems with this argument. And the first one is the one that we've just highlighted, that we can't properly know the sense in which Paul used the word theopneustos. Because it's a hapax legomenon, we can't be fully confident exactly what Paul meant when he used it. And the second problem is that the argument is undermined by its circularity. We're using the words of the Bible itself to authenticate the Bible. In other words, we're saying the proof that the Bible is the word of God is that it says it is. And if you wanted to challenge that, you'd say, well, it would say that, wouldn't it? It's a bit like wondering whether I've got a great sense of humour and, and to find out for sure, asking me whether I've got a great sense of humour. And to navigate our way through these problems and, and reach a sensible conclusion, I think we probably need to go back to the time that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, which was probably around 62 or 63 AD when he was in Rome approaching the end of his ministry and his life. And at that time, the Bible that we recognised didn't exist, not least because there was no New Testament. And that wasn't pulled together in an agreed format for another 300 years or so, as we'll talk about in a moment. So when Paul talks about Scripture, his point of reference can only be the Hebrew Scriptures, what we'd recognise today as the Old Testament. Now, if you had copies of the Bible in the pews, the new international version that you'd open would have 39 different books in the Old Testament. If you were a Catholic, there'd be 46. And if you were a member of the Eastern Orthodox Church, there'd be 49. But if you were an Orthodox Jew, however, your Tanakh, your equivalent of the Old Testament, would only have 24 books. And the point being that there were lots of writing in, writings in circulation in Paul's time and different views as to what was authoritative and what wasn't. 
Now, what Paul actually says about these writings in 2 Tim- Timothy chapter 3 often gets missed in the rush to get to verse 16, where he says, all scripture is theopneustos. But before that, in verse 15, Paul talks first about holy scripture. Uh, the words he uses are hieragramata. And these, he says, are the writings which Timothy has been reading throughout his life. And these have given him the wisdom to achieve salvation through faith in Christ. It's only then in verse 16 that Paul widens things to talk about all of Scripture, or pasagraphe. And this is what Paul says is theopneustos and ophelimos, which which means useful to Timothy, in adding to his learning and the development of his Christian character. Now, there's a slight but significant difference between the Greek words that Paul uses here, which are commonly both translated as scripture. The grammata in verse 15 that Timothy has been reading all his life is a word that usually refers to official documents, papers or records, something which is formal and associated with state business. But the word graphe in verse 16 is a vaguer and more informal, a wider word, which means paintings or drawings quite often, but also refers to any form of writing or writings. And so we can maybe translate this passage like this, that the hierogrammata Paul mentions in verse 15 are the Tanakh, the 24 books which were officially recognized by the Jewish faith. And Paul says these are of vital importance. It's from studying these on a lifelong basis that Timothy has been able to understand who Jesus is, why he came, and where he stands within the centuries-old context of the Jewish faith. And meanwhile, by parsagraphe, the vaguer term, all of Scripture, Paul is referring to a wider corpus of literature, possibly including the Hebrew books which sit outside the Tanakh, possibly including the works which were starting to emerge within the early church. And these, he says, are theopneustos. They also have the breath of God in them. They are the product of the movement of God's Spirit, his inspiration. And so they are useful to Timothy as he seeks to build his Christian life. And if that is what Paul is talking about here... And there came to pass fairly shortly afterwards a process of deciding which of these newer books should also be considered to be hieragramata, or holy scripture. In this period, at the end of the first century AD, as the early church was growing, the number of books and letters which were written in and by that church started to multiply. And as they did so, there was an increasingly urgent discussion about which ones should be given most prominence, which ones should be considered to reflect the truth about Jesus, who he was, and why he came. And one of the problems that the early church had was the number of false beliefs about Jesus that came into circulation around the same time. And this problem was exacerbated by the fact that the proponents of these false beliefs quickly realized that the best, pe- the best way to get people to read their books and letters was to pretend that they'd actually been written by one of Jesus' disciples or by Paul. And so there was a proliferation of reading material within the early church that purported to come from the people closest to Jesus, but which really contained false beliefs and false accounts of his life and words. And so there needed to be a sifting process, a discernment process, whereby the bishops of the early church sought to identify those works in circulation that they could trust, as opposed to those which they couldn't. And so the concept of the canon arose, a list of approved works which were considered to reflect the true life, works and teaching of Jesus and the true meaning of his coming. And we've got written evidence of the process uh, at work here uh, in the works of prominent early bishops and scholars such as Oregon, Eusebius and Athanasius and details of how they decided what was authentic and what wasn't. And they used a, a clear set of criteria which were broadly as follows. First, can we tell who wrote it? Were they either a disciple of Jesus or did they use disciples of Jesus as a source? Second, when was it written? Was it close enough to Jesus' lifetime for us to be confident that it hadn't been falsified or corrupted in the meantime? Third, was it widely acknowledged by different churches across the world? And fourth, was it consistent uh, both with other accepted writings and with the teaching of the church so as to make up an orthodox and persuasive body of work? And the culmination of this process came in a synod in in Hippo in 393 AD when St. Augustine was instrumental in moving a debate to approve the 27 books of our current New Testament as the authorised canon, four biographies or gospels, one history, 
21 letters and one prophecy. And at the same time, there appears to have been a recognition that there were other books, books which we can still read today, such as the Shepherd of Hermas, the Didache, the Letter of Barnabas, which had some merit, but which failed to meet those strict criteria that the church had set for itself. And meanwhile, there were still other books which were rejected at the time as downright heretical. So going back to our theme for today of the authority, the authenticity of the Bible, what we've talked about this morning gives me a considerable degree of comfort and reassurance. First, there's the fact that Paul felt that Timothy's lifelong study of the Hebrew Scriptures, the books of the Old Testament, was the basis of the wisdom which had led him to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this gives me confidence that when I read the Old Testament, I'll find in there a route to Jesus, a narrative that culminates in his coming, and which makes sense of it in the context of all the history that led up to it. And it may not be easy or straightforward, but if I study it prayerfully, it'll tell me the same things that it told Timothy. And second, there's the fact that the New Testament was the product of a prolonged sifting process conducted by learned men to identify those Christian writings from the first and second centuries AD, which are most trustworthy, as opposed to those which are not. And I'm reassured to know that men of great faith, who lived much closer to the time of their composition than I do, who had much more contemporary and personal information to hand, questioned those writings in order to satisfy themselves that what they were reading had true authority. It represented right thinking about Jesus' life and how we should respond to it. And third, there's Paul's intimation that other works that might be read outside the Old and New Testaments are theopneustos. They have something of the breath of God in them. This encourages me to continue to read and study beyond the Bible, to benefit from the thoughts and learning of those others, ancient and modern, whom God has inspired with his wisdom. And ultimately, when I read the Bible, I also know this, that its books are the products of centuries of different writers from different eras and different walks of life with a wide range of different perspectives, traditionalists, historians, poets, royal scribes, kings and queens, prophets and priests, fishermen, tax collectors, doctors, tent makers, apostles, all of these people, high-born and lowly, seeking and engaging with God, hearing his voice, receiving his inspiration, obeying his commands, walking in his ways, encountering his son, and trying to make sense of it all. Paul's conclusion that this is ophelimos, that it's useful, I think is something of an understatement. As he says, the value of this for my education as a Christian, my discipleship, the refinement of how I live my life so that it follows Jesus' example, the equipment it gives me to meet life's challenges in the right way, it's not just useful, it's priceless. And so my prayer for us this morning is this, that we may delight to read the Bible, that we may be thankful that these books have survived and been curated across the centuries, and that their wisdom is available for us to learn from. May God's Spirit teach us and guide us through its words, its verses and chapters, in confidence that these are the result of their writers engaging faithfully with him, hearing his voice and responding to it. And may we open ourselves to being shaped and changed by our reading, trained and equipped in righteousness, so that we too may know God better and do his works. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,